President, please be seated. The chamber continues its hearing. In case 02 slash 02, as scheduled by the uh, trial chamber, and which has been informed uh, to the public and the concerned parties, the chamber shall hear testimonies of witnesses and uh, civil parties in relation to the Pantmore Dam worksite. And today, the chamber hears testimony of a civil party that is through TCCP 220. However, the chamber has been seized by a submission of the co-prosecutor on the 24th July 2015 concerning its latest disclosure of case 004 statements in relation to the Pyongyang Dam and that the statements shall be included in case 002 slash 02. For that reason, the Chamber will hold a brief submissions and observations by both the co-prosecutors and the concerned parties before we proceed to hear testimony of a civil party to TCCP 220. And for the substantive hearing today, and the uh, following days, the chamber wishes to inform the uh, parties that it is likely that uh, from today, and it may last for uh, two weeks, Judge Fans is absent due to urgent personal matters. And after the bench deliberated the matter, Judge Martin Cropton has been selected to replace Judge Friends during her absence until such time she is able to return to the bench. And that decision is based on Rule 79.4 of the ECCC internal rules. Grafshi, Ms. Sekulwuti, please report the attendance of the parties and other individuals at today's proceedings. Sekulwuti, Mr. President, for today's proceedings, all parties to discuss are present. Mr. Nunji is present in the holding cell downstairs as he requests to have his direct presence in the courtroom. His favor has been delivered to the uh, Grafji. The civil party who is to testify today, namely to TCCP 220, is ready to be uh, called by the chamber. Thank you. President, thank you. The chamber now decides on the request by Nunji. The chamber has received a waiver from the accused Nguyen Chia, dated 27 July 2015, which notes that due to his health, namely headache, backache, and that he cannot sit and concentrate for long, and in order to effectively participate in future hearings, he requests to waive his rights to participate in and be present at the 27 July 2015 hearing. The defense for the accused has informed his client of the consequences of the waiver that it cannot be construed as a waiver of a fair trial right 
a right to challenge evidence presented or admitted to the court at all times. Having seen the medical report on Nunji by the duty doctor for the accused at the ECCC, dated 27 July 2015, who notes that Nunji has chronic back pain when he sits for long and recommends that the chamber grant him his request so that he can follow the proceedings remotely from the holding cell downstairs. Based on the above information and pursuant to Rule 815 of the ECCC internal rules, the chamber grants Nunji his request to follow today's proceedings remotely from the holding cell downstairs where an audiovisual means. The AB unit personnel are instructed to link the proceedings to the room downstairs so that Nunji can follow it remotely. That applies for the whole day. And before the resumption of its hearing, the Chamber wishes to inform the parties and the public that on 24 July 2015, it was seized with the International Court Prosecutor's latest disclosure of case 004 statements and its submissions that all 54 statements and civil party application relate the Trapeantmo Dam, that is document E319-25.1 says the President. As considering the effects disclosure may have on the Chamber's present schedule at the outset of the hearing, the Chamber inf informed the parties and invite them to provide uh, observation whether the disclosure will make an impact on the uh, hearing of the uh, Trapeantmo Dam. And on 29th and 30 July 2015, respectively, the Chamber actually is scheduled to hear through witnesses Which are, who are not related to the Trapeantmo uh, Dam work site. However, it may have uh, some uh, relationship to the disclosure of the statements requested by the international co-prosecutor. And the two witnesses are through TCW 866 on Kapung Airport. And after that, the chamber will hear another uh, witness that is through TCW 926 on the 1st January dam worksite. And the uh, chamber would like to ask the co-prosecutors as to when those disclosures uh, would uh, be uh, made per your request and whether it has any impact on the uh, facts uh, being debated uh, in relation to the Pantomo Dam uh, work site. The Chamber will then hand the floor to the lead co-lawyers and the defense teams to respond to the uh, submission by the co-prosecutors and each team will have 10 minutes uh, to make such an observation to the co-prosecutor's uh, submission. And first, the chamber would like to give the floor to the co-prosecutors to make an oral uh, submission in regards to the impact of uh, your request of uh, disclosures concerning the scheduling of hearings <coughs> already made by the uh, trial chamber for today and the uh, following days in relation to the Pentmo Dam work site. And co-prosecutor, you may proceed. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. President, your honors, parties. Um, let me first uh, answer the first 
issue that was raised in the email uh, you circulated on Friday, which is to address the substance and timing of the disclosure. Um, there are essentially two types of documents that were disclosed in this filing. Uh, the first uh, was five recent OCIJ interviews from case four uh, that contain some information relevant to trapping to Ma Dam. Uh, as, as this court is aware, um, there have been a, a large number of witness interviews conducted in case four relating to Prey Net Prey District and therefore touching upon the Trappian Tama Dam. Um, over 60 such interviews were disclosed earlier this year uh, in March and April. Uh, since that time, there have been five new OCIJ interviews relevant to the subject that were notified to us uh, and which we received translations uh, between May and July 2015. So that is the first uh, group of documents disclosed, uh, five new OCIJ interviews. The larger part of the disclosure consists of uh, civil party applications, a total of 47 civil party applications from case four that relate or contain some references to the trapping to Maud Dam. And there are two things I would like to note about those civil party applications. Uh, first, in regards to the number of pages disclosed, uh, if you were to add up the total number of pages of the civil party applications, it would look fairly high, uh, over 500 pages. Uh, but as this court knows, um, most of the pages in the civil applications uh, are form are form matters with procedural content uh, where the civil parties check boxes, biographical information, addresses, such things, copies of national ID cards. Uh, for each of these civil, ap civil party applications, there are usually a one or two page uh, insert at the end in which the civil party describes the information they have in terms of what they, uh, what they experienced during the regime. So um, we've gone through them and the actual number of pages from these 47 civil party applications in which there are actual statements from the civil party is only 94 pages. Uh, for the five new OCIJ interviews, uh, fortunately they are fairly short. Uh, so they total about 44 pages between the five. Uh, I would also note, uh, uh, also note that uh, only part of uh, these filings uh, actually relate to Trapyang Tama. Uh, when you look at these civil party applications, you usually see that there's perhaps one paragraph uh, out of the one or two page, uh, one or two page description uh, that is about trapping Tama. So there is uh, perhaps my first comment is that there's not as much material to review as may appear if you look at the ERN pages. Uh, I was, uh, myself, I was away in Canada the past three weeks. Uh, so the first time uh, I saw these new materials was on Friday. And uh, even in my jet lag condition, uh, I was able to get through those materials in, in the afternoon. The second point I want to make sure uh, that is understood about the civil party applications is that the date which appears in the annex we filed uh, is the date that the document was prepared or signed by the civil party. It is not the date that the document was notified to our office or put on the case file. Civil party applications, as you may know, go through a process where they go through the victim's unit who enter, enters them into a database and does um, some other things that I'm not completely familiar with before they get to the case file. So let me give you an example of the timing relating to these civil party applications. If you look at the first civil party application in our annex, that's number two in the chart. 
a document that's now been assigned the number E319.25.3.2. E319 slash 25.3.2. Uh, in our annex, you will see the date of June 1, 2013. That is the date the application was signed by the civil party. The document was processed by the victim's unit on the 27th of June, 2014, so about one year later. And when you look at these documents, the stamp that you will see on the cover page with the date is not the date it was put on the case file, it's the date it was processed by the victim's unit. So this application, signed June 2013, processed by victim's unit at June 2014, the application, the original Khmer, was notified and placed on the case file on the 1st of September 2014, and the English translation of that application was placed on the case file on the 11th of March 2015. Another thing I want to bring to the court's attention is that some of the dates listed in our annex, um, which is a printout from our case map database, uh, turn out to be incorrect. Uh, I, was, I checked into this because when I looked at the annex on Friday, there was a number of applications that had 2009, 2011 dates, and that seemed early for me. Um, and when I checked the actual dates of these, there are 17 applications that we listed as, or that were listed from the case map printouts as 2009 or 2011, but which were all actually dated or signed by the civil party in 2013. There is only uh, two of these applications uh, that were earlier. And again, to give you a sense of the timing related to these applications, let me point out one of those. Number 33 on our annex um, is one of the two civil party applications uh, that was uh, from 2011. Uh, it was assigned by the civil party applicant on the 14th of June, 2011, filed by his lawyer on the 30th of June, 2011 processed by the victim's unit on the 13th of November, 2012, and not placed on the case file and notified uh, to the parties, including us, until the 8th of May, 2013. Uh, the English translation of that application was posted 30 April, 2015. So uh, in terms of your question regarding timing, it should be understood that the dates in our annex, uh, in addition to some of them being incorrect, do not represent the dates these materials became available uh, to our office. Uh, all that said, uh, we all understand it is far from our deal, far from ideal for us to have to file these the week before a trial segment is to begin. That is certainly something we don't want to do would like to try to avoid. Um, everyone in this court works with uh, limited resources, including the people who have to process and file these civil party applications, which I presume is why they take a while to work their way from the civil party into the case file. Um, so, while it is, if you look at the actual dates, uh, the English translations of these applications generally became available to us between 2014, 2015. Nonetheless, uh, our office has to set priorities in, in terms of what we do. So our first priority uh, with the case for investigation and disclosure issues was the interviews, the witness interviews conducted by uh, o OCIJ. Uh, those struck us from the beginning <coughs> as something that was an important source of evidence. And our first effort was to get on top of those 
and make sure uh, the, the witness interviews uh, were disclosed where relevant. The civil party applications were a second, the next priority of our office. And that is part of the reason that this timing comes now rather than earlier in this year. I wish we were able to have the resources and the ability to review all these civil party applications as soon as they come in, but that's simply not the case. If we had allocated resources to review the some 1,000 civil party applications in case four, we would have had to take away resources from other things. Um, so I think that, I hope that answers your first question in terms of the substance and timing of what was disclosed. Let me address your other question, which is, does this affect the ability to go forward? Uh, I believe the answer to that is no. Reason, um, there are almost 100 OCIJ witness interviews relevant to Trapi and Kama that have been before the parties for some time. Um, those from case two, which have been available since the judicial investigation, and those from case four, which were made available in March or April of this year. There are another 84 witness statements, primarily DC CAM interviews, um, some originating in case two, and others that were part of a uh, later group of DC CAM interviews that we were included in our June 2014 trial document list. And there were 99 civil parties who filed applications or supplementary statements relating to Trapian Kama Dam in case two. Why am I telling you all this? Um, there is a wealth of information that has been available to the parties for a long time. Uh, and because of that, it is highly unlikely that there is uh, any unknown or new information uh, in these largely civil party applications that would have any effect on how uh, our office or the other parties will proceed in questioning the witnesses who are to be heard in Trapping Kama. It's, it's inconceivable to me with there being almost 200 witness interviews and 100 civil party applications relating to this Trapping Kama Dam uh, that these new, new case uh, civil party applications from case four cover any new ground. Uh, I've looked over them myself uh, and indeed I would describe them as what you would expect. They're corroborative of what the other hundreds of victims who have statements already before this court have said about the general conditions at this dam. Is this something that would affect how we would proceed this week? No. Uh, the only uh, document I would point out that I believe is likely to be used um, over the next few weeks is a civil party application that comes from 2 TCW 908. This document is number 48 on our annex. And this is an individual who is scheduled to testify. Uh, he is the last Trapping Kama Dam witness, however, number 11 on the list. So I'm assuming they're estimating that he won't testify for probably three weeks. Um, so that uh, I hope answers your questions. Uh, I'm uh, prepared to answer any any other any other questions you may have. President, thank you. And Judge Lavalente, you have the floor. Merci. Thank you, President, for giving me the floor. And thank you, Mr. Prosecutor, for these explanations. I have a question. I read through the annex, uh, and I have noticed that for some documents, the R ERNs, uh, are not mentioned neither in Khmer, English, or French. 
Could you perhaps shed some light on the matter? Uh, on the versions that are available either in Khmer, English, or French, I, I imagine that all these documents are available in Khmer. I would like to be certain of that. And could you tell us how many of these documents are available in an English version? And perhaps they are all available in English, and which ones are available in French? You said that, that about uh, on the civil party applications, 94 pages were relevant. Um, I presume that these are 94 pages in English. That is my first question to you, Mr. Prosecutor. Uh, thank you, Judge Laverne. Um, I, I'm not sure which documents you're referring to that lack year ends. The, the version of the annex that I'm, I'm looking at has year ends. Uh, perhaps there's uh, been some error. There are a, a small number um, that there's maybe one of them or two that are only in Khmer. Uh, and there is one um, that uh, is listed only in, is available only in English. Um, but the others, I believe, all have Khmer uh, and English ERN. Um, but I need to go through and I'm flipping through it right now. And at least in the version that I have, uh, almost all of them have both Khmer and English ERN. A smaller number have French translations. Um, my observation is that the, uh, with both the witness interviews and the civil par party applications in case four, they're being translated into English first, Fr French after that. Um, so I don't know whether, uh, whether there's a specific document that you're concerned of, whether there's something wrong with the annex that made it through into the, into the filing, but the annex that I have has, does have those year ends. document I was referring to is E319 slash 25.3 documents 4, 6, 8, 9, 11, 14. Uh, the, there's a certain uh, relatively high number, uh, 17, 18, 19, 22. Twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty-six. A high number of documents have no ERNs, and that is why I'm uh, raising the issue. For example, forty, forty-two, forty-three, forty-five, forty-six, forty-nine, fifty-two. None of these documents have the ERN, which is why I'm uh, wondering if uh, these documents are available in the various languages of the court. They are available, Your Honor. I'll, I'll need to take a look at what's happened. I can assure you that there is an annex that was prepared and believe was our original annex filed that has e ERNs for all of those. I have no idea why you have a version of an annex that doesn't have those year ends. We, we will look into that and, and we will get, make sure that uh, there is a version. We'll make sure there's a version circulated that has the year ends. I, I don't know why, why that is, the, the, because the copy that I'm holding has, has year ends for, for, every doc, for every document, with the exception of three that, two that ha are only in Khmer, one that's only in English. But I, I will look into that and make sure that they're there. But I can assure you that in terms of what will be placed into the, into the folders, electronic folders, there are Khmer and English translations for all these documents, except for, for three, which are only in one language. Thank you very much for that information. I have no further questions to the prosecutor. Uh, 
President, uh, thank you. The Chamber now would like to hand the floor to the lead co-lawyers for several parties to make an observation uh, regarding the submission by the co-prosecutor. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning to everybody. Is it possible for us to make our comments after we have heard the comments from the defense so that we can uh, respond to any specific demands that our colleagues might make? Sinon, je peux bien évidemment. Otherwise, at this stage, I can make some general comments, and I may ask for the floor to respond to the defense subsequently. It's as you wish, Mr. President. President, the chamber requires you to make an observation now so that we can expedite our proceeding. As you may be aware, the defense teams will have the last chance to speak. Très bien, je vous remercie. Thank you very much. In that case, we have some very brief observations to make. Just to recall that Ampil and myself are co-lawyers in the same predicament as the defence co-lawyers. We do not have access to case files three and four, and so we came across these documents on Friday, as the other parties did. In the folder provided, we can see that there are 54 documents in Khmer, 54 in English, and we are therefore assuming that all of the documents have been translated into English. On the other hand, only 20 are in French. We have perused these documents on Friday afternoon, and we defer to the wisdom of this court as to whether the hearing of certain witnesses uh, of, from Trapiang Tma uh, should be deferred or not. We also have points to make about uh, the disclosures. We understand the requests and objections from the defense. Each party must, of course, be able to decide by itself and for itself about what is necessary for this new segment. We are also keen to point out what is important to us, namely that the trial should move forward as swiftly as possible, and therefore we defer to the Chamber to weigh up these different rights within the trial. But we do assume that this week can go forward because we have uh, one witness on Trapiang Tma Dam and one on the 1st of January Dam. But again, we defer to the wisdom of the tribunal on this point, and we do understand that any objection, that, that objections may be raised by other parties. Thank you, Mr. President. President, thank you. The floor is now given to the defense teams for the accused. First, the defense team for Mr. Nguyen Chia. You may proceed to make an observation in relation to the disclosure of a new document by the OCP. You may not proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, good morning, Your Honours. Good morning, Council. Um, I think it might be worth might be worthwhile to put this last disclosure disclosure in a in a little bit of perspective. Um, we have done some, uh, some math and have now seen that this is the 13th um, disclosure since the first one uh, in November 2014. Um, those 13 disclosures bring us to a total of um, 7,744 pages plus an estimate uh, 600 pages 
um, a total of 8,344 8, pages, so almost 8,500 pages. Um, to remind the Chamber of earlier disclosure, I would like to refer to, for instance, the disclosure of um, 20 March 2015, where we received about 2,600 pages. Um, Disclosure number 10, April, 28 April 2015, where we received about 1,057 pages. Um, now, with another 600 pages, like I said, bring it in to a total of 8,500 pages. Um, speaking about resources, have we been able, has the defense been able to uh, read all these uh, new documents coming from case three and four? Um, the only answer that we can give to that question is marginally. Um, we have had a very demanding uh, trial schedule in the last uh, months before the recess. Um, of course, we had to prepare for the, um, the three hearings uh, in appeal uh, held by the Supreme Court Chamber early uh, July. Um, have we really been able to properly read uh, these documents in the sense of really evaluating uh, the documents as evidence? Uh, no, the, question is, the answer to the question is no. Have we been able uh, to discuss the content of these um, disclosures uh, with our client? Uh, no. Um, so um, uh, now again, a day before we start a new um, segment, we are again being confronted with 600 new pages. Um, so it's, uh, it's simply for us uh, impossible to even pretend to having read these documents. I, I have no idea how um, the judges, how you, the judges of the trial chamber are doing this. Uh, we certainly can't, uh, especially uh, taking into consideration our resources uh, in, this, in, in relation to um, the prosecution. Um, that's my first point. My second point is um, I'm still a little bit puzzled as to the timing. I've heard, I've listened carefully to uh, the international co-prosecutor on uh, the timing of uh, the, the filing of these um, civil party applications. Uh, even if it's even if the date that I'm looking at, for instance, um, uh, number uh, number three civil party application uh, do document D five eight five seven, if it's not from 2009, but let's say from 2013, um, why did it take two years um, to present this civil party application of this um, civil party? Why, why, why did we have to wait until now? Um, I don't understand uh, the, uh, the delay in time of another two years. Um, there are a number of other documents that are not civil party applications, um, in respect of which the timing also doesn't really make sense to us. For instance, the first document is an OCP interview uh, of somebody whose name I shall not mention, uh, but that's dated the 5th of August, 2008. Um, why was that filed seven years later? I don't understand. Um, there is also a report of an execution of rogatory letter dated uh, September, 2011, and that's being filed uh, now. Um, also, that is something that I don't understand. Um, Actually, the same goes also for the, the written uh, records of investigation of the witnesses in case four. Uh, I've looked through them, uh, but most of them, the one is, is from March 2015, one is from April 2015, one is from May 2015, one is from 10 June 2015, one is from April 2015. Um, we are all full of fully aware that this segment uh, was even scheduled to, to uh, start before the recess. I really don't see a reason why um, we are being confronted with these uh, documents.
WRIs at this stage. Um, so um, I would say that the categorization, categorization of far from ideal is um, maybe the understatement of the year, I wouldn't say, but it's quite an understatement. Uh, where it all boils down to is that we simply have no uh, room, we have no possibility to, uh, to, uh, to properly um, question the witness or the civil party that is upcoming. Obviously, we need to have a look, uh, even only a marginal look, um, at these um, new civil party applications, whether they have any uh, bearing or, or effect on, this, on these upcoming uh, witnesses. But of course, Maybe the most principled question is why, why should we even allow these civil party applications to enter our case? Um, um, what is their material importance that um, would allow them to be brought into our case file? Why can't we simply say, uh, let the lawyers and the judges in case three and four deal with these uh, civil party applications. Why? What's the necessity? What's the strong necessity to have these uh, civil party applications com become part of uh, case two? Of course, I understand what's behind it. Um, well, it's maybe speculation, but uh, the idea that case three and four will ever happen, um, that's of course very unlikely. That's probably the reason why we are still being flooded with all that new evidence coming from case three and four. But um, going back to uh, the remarks I made in the beginning, uh, putting this in perspective of almost eight and a half thousand pages, I think we have uh, now reached the moment that we should say enough is enough. Uh, let these civil party applications belong to where they were originally filed in case three and four. Let them deal with it. Um, and if you think uh, that should not be the situation, then obviously we need some time uh, to have a look at them. We didn't receive them yet. Um, we are in the lucky position or lucky between um, brackets that uh, on Wednesday and Thursday we have two witnesses who are not relating, related to uh, this segment. So by postponing um, today's civil party and tomorrow's witness, we would in, in effect have uh, in total a week extra. But of course I say that with the big caveat that um, actually having the resources and time to properly read these civil party applications um, I don't think that is uh, really the issue. Last remark, um, I might add that civil party applications um, are not just merely applications. In the judgment in 2-1, these applications have been, have formed an, 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 a very important part of the used evidence. Um, so um, based on our experience uh, in case 2-1, these civil party applications need to be considered uh, and need to give them the same weight as, as proper evidence coming from witnesses. Um, and in addition, we have seen in 2-2, uh, uh, in this trial, that a lot of those civil party applications uh, have all kinds of defects in them. Um, the witnesses sometimes come here and say, I've never said that. Uh, they are written down by unknown people who have sometimes no idea what the actual civil party have said. So we have to be very, very careful with these civil party applications. If we now let them in like this, uh, they're in, they will never go out, and uh, uh, that is problematic. So I don't think we should make any distinction really between uh, civil party applications as such and um, WRIs of proper witnesses. Um, so, uh, Mr. President, one, uh, dismiss the request. Two, uh, if you do not dismiss the request, um, give us at least today and tomorrow to have a first look at these um, new disclosures. Thank you. Question. Thank you. Now the defense team for Mr. Kirchenhorn have the floor.
Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning to you, sir, to the Chamber, to all of the parties here. Mr. President, from the standpoint of the Cus Enfants defense, we see this problem of repeated disclosures as being something that is taking on alarming proportions and which is challenging even the fairness of the trial. I think it's a little bit lightweight for a co-prosecutor to say that in one afternoon you can go through these 54 new documents. I think that's taking the work of the defense somewhat lightly because when documents are communicated, it's not a matter of simply reading through them. You have to do proper defense work, cross-check information contained in the documents with other documents, and carry out thoroughgoing analyses. Now, if the co-prosecutor is picking up on work that's already been done by his colleagues, so he can go through the documents quickly, well, that is some that he is entitled to do, but you can't expect the defense to do the same. The most important one, perhaps, is is uh, the phenomenon we've seen over the last few months, whereby within trial 002, we are seeing a whole lot of documents relating to an investigation that is currently underway. And I must stress this because, as my colleague from the Nunchir defense team has said, there are defense teams that are working on the investigations for cases two and four, and there are rights that are attached to those people being investigated and they have the right to demand that certain documents are drafted and that is not our case here. My colleague referred to the actual figures for documents just now, documents that we don't really, that we are not really acquainted with. Now today what we're trying to find out is to know what the purpose is of the disclosure by the prosecution. Is this uh, possibly uh, exculpatory material, in which case we might need to know on what points? Is this a case of further evidence in case number two, in which case is the evidence not sufficient already? What I've also heard appears to be, well, we can go through these documents pretty briskly because they don't provide any new information. In which case, if they don't provide any information, I would say, then why bring them into the file? Why have tons and tons of new evidence that we are not acquainted with? I remind you that we are not basing ourselves on the investigations for cases three and four. So my first reaction is, these documents uh, are so significant, uh, then they should be rejected and therefore there won't be any delays. In the last few months, we have to consistent, continually beg for extra time so as to review documents that uh, might lead to sentences for our clients. And we are therefore working under difficult conditions we have other jobs to do at the same time, and we are being asked to be endlessly more and more flexible, to work in harder and harder conditions, and in conditions that will make it harder and harder to defend our clients. Well, yes, the trial must go on, but not under any conditions whatsoever. Now today we've been told 54 documents, well there's only 500 pages, but only X number of pages are actually useful to the case. Well, that may be the position of the prosecution, but as we stand here and now, I haven't seen these documents in depth. We have to sign off before seeing the documents and 
on Friday we weren't actually in the office and so today, this morning, we can only sign the paper that will allow us to see the documents. And most of these documents are not available in French anyway. So here again, the question of the necessary time to review them comes up. So that we can sit down with the people who work in Khmer, the people who work in English, in our team. Now we're being told, oh, we can push forward, there's no problem, really. It's not going to make things too difficult for the defense, don't worry. Well, what is the point of the 54 documents if we can just proceed with business as usual? If there's no particular point to them, let's simply withdraw them. If they have a purpose and if they're useful and if the prosecution is intending to use them either now or later on by requesting their filing, then I simply state that we should be given the time to look at them. It is just a matter of equal arms between the parties. Today we are speaking blindly. I'm talking about documents that I've only seen the description of in the annexes. I don't know what the contents of the documents are. I don't know if we can continue with the civil parties in this way. So the simple conclusion is to take these documents off the file and to continue uh, while we are uh, trying case number two to allow the investigations for cases three and four to continue. And as my colleague Nunch uh, said uh, a few weeks ago, uh, a certain number of civil parties have stated that a number of documents filled out in their name were not actually reliable, and I don't wish to see them filed uh, without knowing that we're going to hear those civil parties. Therefore, as I have said, if there are important reasons why the prosecution would like to see these documents on file or for the witnesses to be summoned, then fine, in which case the proper work of the court will continue with the cross-examination of witnesses and adversarial debate and if there are witnesses to be summoned then they should be summoned but we should not simply file thousands of uh, written papers into the proceedings that some of the parties have not seen Therefore, if you believe that the parties should be seeing these documents and that they can be used by the parties, then quite clearly there will not be any time to hear a witness at this stage talking about uh, Kropian Khmer Dam. We cannot just proceed with business as usual and leave us a blindly a disadvantage vis-à-vis -vis the prosecution in this way. Then there's another question that we have to come back to, which is that of the weight to be given to the statements that have already been put on the case file. And the requests that may be made by the prosecution. But let me remind you that there is trial going on in which Mr. Kyu Sampan has certain rights and statements cannot be taken at face value just like that if they're also going to be coming up for debate in cases three and four. So either completely reject all of these new documents and then we can continue. If you wish us to base our debates on these documents then I'm afraid we have to have the time to review them and two days of hearing today are not going to be enough. Either a proper deferral of one week in addition to the two days of this week right now because we don't have any problem with dealing with witnesses about Kampong Shan and the 1st of January dam. But you can
cannot say that this is something which has uh, almost no relevance to the work of the defense. That's the way the prosecution sees it, perhaps, but this is simply not true. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am, you may not proceed. That will be co-prosecutor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, first, I wanted to uh, update uh, uh, the information I received in regard to Judge Laverne's question. I, I think what happened is before we did the formal filing, we circulated a preliminary version of the annex so that the, the process of assigning document numbers and processing could begin. And what made it into your hands was the not the filed version of the annex, but a preliminary version. Um, so I'm told that's the reason that you may have ended up with a version of the annex that doesn't have the DRNs in, in it. Um, uh, second, I do want to respond to the issue of when these documents could, when the defense could have started reviewing these documents. Um, they were offered to them uh, lunchtime Friday. The Noon Chea team responded saying they didn't want the documents. They wouldn't sign the acceptance. They didn't want them until lunchtime on Monday. Uh, as I said, and I was not relying on any, anyone else's work, I went through these materials by myself Friday afternoon to see what was there. They refused to take the documents Friday at lunchtime. Uh, the Q Sampan team didn't respond, even respond to our email sent at fr Friday lunchtime offering to make these documents available. Um, the second thing I want to make sure is clear, this is not a request for admission of these documents. This is a disclosure. It is a disclosure so that these civil party applications which are in case four are available should the trial chamber, should the parties want to look at them. It's not our intention to request that these be admitted. The only ones I foresee potentially being admitted for sure are the ones that relate to, for example, the witness who's going to testify. I would think that probably one of the parties will want to make use of that document. But there is already, there is, it is certainly true, there is already plenty of corroborative civil party applications, victim statements from people who won't testify as witnesses here without us having to admit these. So the reason we are disclosing them is just so they are available. Should one of the other parties look and say, oh, this particular individual looks quite interesting to me, I would like to request them to come and appear at some time in these proceedings, which will continue for another year. We want that option to be available. Now, should the defense not want us to disclose further civil party applications, we would be happy to be relieved from that burden. But it will need to be done with the clear waiver and statement from the defense. We, of course, would continue, uh, uh, we, in, instead of doing what we did here, which was to make available as a disclosure all the, all the interviews, we were, or all the civil party applications, we would still disclose ones, obviously, that related to people who would testify if there was a civil party application that was exculpatory, we certainly would make it available. Uh, if there was something that was of particular significance, um, we would do that. What we have done here as, is a disclosure of the civil party applications relating to Trapping Kamadam as a matter of fairness to make sure they are available, not as a request to admit these, these, these documents. And that's an important, important distinction. A um, couple other points. Um, the o OCP interview from 2008, um, this disclosure was done uh, while some of us from the trial team were not here. Uh, the reason this was not disclosed earlier was because it really doesn't have any substantive information on trapping Kama. It's someone who said they, they knew of the site, but then said they didn't have any information about it. Um, our instructions to people were to err on the side of disclosure, but not to disclose documents where someone mentions Trappian Kamadam but doesn't provide any information. So the, 
2008 document um, is, is, as you will see if you, when you look at the documents, uh, not one that has any material information. It, sh it probably it should not have been disclosed. Um, I think I've responded to the issues that have come up, so unless you have any further questions. President, Judge Rabbi, and just a few other tools. Uh, there's one uh, clarification that I would like the OCP to give us. What is the number of the document or uh, in the annex? This, this 2008 document that you just mentioned that should not have been uh, uh, communicated to you because it was not relevant. What is the number on your list? Is it the first First one, the 1.2.11.8? Uh, yes, the, the documents are in alphabetical order by the name. And so uh, the name of this person, uh, yes, this is the first one that appears. Um, and it's, it, it's not as if there is any, anything that's been improperly disclosed. Uh, it's simply when I read this interview on Friday, um, the witness says that they uh, participated in the building of the Trappy and Tama Dam, uh, but then when asked what were the conditions said, I did not participate in, in the work. For, for me, if I were here when this disclosure was made, I, we wouldn't have disclosed this just because it does not seem to be uh, of, of, any, of any weight. Uh, that's simply the point I'm making about this 2008 document. The reason it wasn't disclosed earlier was because we reviewed it and decided it wasn't of any particular relevance. And somehow in the process of doing this disclosure, it got, it got thrown into the mix. Happy to be released to make any additional observations. Anyone? It seems none. The Chamber wishes to express its sincere thanks to all parties for your submissions on this matter. There is an exposure statement in page 02, uh, page 04 to page 02 slash 02. And the uh, Chamber will take a break now and resume at 20 to 11 so that uh, during this break the chamber will deliberate this uh, matter as announced the judges of the bench and then we will uh, proceed after the break.